Good evening, good evening, good evening. July 24th, 2019, and we are uh, back again uh, talking about uncommon planning processes, myths about interest rates. It's uh, Steve LeBroy, LeBroy Insurance Group. I'm the author of Build Your Human Equity Line of Credit, based in Washington, D.C., operating nationwide, uh, and my partner, uh, Rich Klaus, uh, Charter Financial Consultant of Goldberg, Klaus, and Agile, who's going to lead the charge tonight. Uh, and a lot of it's based on the book, Rich Dentist, Poor Dentist. And we love helping our dentist clients all across the country. So without further ado, uh, let's let Rich uh, take it away. Hey, Steve. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedules. Uh, we got quite a few people on tonight. Um, first of all, I want to start with tonight is not going to be about how you're going to make tons and tons of money. Tonight is going to be about things that maybe you thought were true and aren't, and they're myths about interest rates. So we're going to learn some things tonight. And what you need to kind of think through is that if you're working with advisors and you haven't heard any of these things about how other banks and institutions are making money and that you're not making money, you might want to think in a little bit more about getting a second opinion from Steve and I on what are you missing out there? As Steve said earlier, we talk about uncommon planning processes. What's the uncommon mean? Meaning that most all of our dentists have uncommon incomes, much more than the average U.S. citizen out there, and we help our clients develop uncommon assets. But when you have uncommon income and uncommon assets, you need to do things differently than what traditionally is being done by most people out there. So let's kind of get started with it. So here's a few thoughts uh, and myths we're gonna explore tonight. First, is 0% on car loans really zero? Most people think it is. We're gonna show you a few things to think differently about. What's the real cost if you pay any of your insurance premiums on a monthly basis instead of an annual? You know, are the insurance companies charging you extra to do that? If a bank pays you, now that we're talking about the 1980s here and we're gonna come forward from there, but if a bank pays you a 9% rate of return on the CD and then loans your money out at 15%, is that a 6% rate of return? Seems very logical to think that it is. Next, the Laffer curve. Ar Arthur Laffer was in the Reagan cabinet back in the 80s and he did a piece that he's been credited. He claims he didn't do it, but it's called the Laffer curve and it goes through, do income taxes, how much do income taxes really uh, affect your rate of return long-term? Mutual funds show average rates of return. What we're looking tonight to do the different, and some of you have seen this before, we're gonna go a little more detail, um, are average rates of return different than actual rates of return? If you pay cash for a car, equipment, or real estate, have you eliminated the interest cost? What we're talking about over here is a lot of people take the money and they give it to the banks and the bank doesn't give you back really what you should be getting back. So let's kind of get started and, and learn what most people will never know because the institutions don't want us to know. Most advisors aren't taught any of this. So Steve and I can bring a lot of interesting things to the table. So first of all, is zero really 0% interest. A 0% car loan, is it really zero? One of the interesting points is the largest money maker for the auto industry is their financing companies. GMAC, Ford Motor Credit, BMW Financial, just to name a few. Don't you think it's a little interesting that if they make more money financing cars, why would they give you a 0% interest rate? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Well, that's really because it's not quite a 0% interest rate that we're going to show here in a few minutes. So there are a couple issues just off the top with a 0% interest rate. One is many times the payback schedule is set up over a shorter number of years. As an example, traditionally you may be able to go out and get a 48 month, a 60 month car loan. Many times the 0% interest or the 0.9% interest are 24 months or 36 months. Well, if that is right, what's that mean? That makes the payment 
too high to be affordable. So it's not really possible for a lot of people from a cash flow perspective to be able to take advantage of that. And that's not always the case. Sometimes they have it longer. But the point we're trying to figure out tonight is, is zero really zero? Let's look at the numbers. Here's a 0% car loan up here. And we're talking about a car with at $45,000. Now, 0%, this calculator just shows, at a 0% rate over 48 months, your payment would be $937.50, which that is a 0% because it's that divided by 12. Let's look, most of the time, and you probably have seen it, many people just forget about it because they don't have enough money. But if there's a $5,000 rebate, all of a sudden that car really costs $40,000. A 0% on $40,000 at 48 months is $833 a month. That's a pretty significant savings, $104 a month. Well, wait a minute, how, how do you qualify for that? What do you need to do? But first of all, let's see if you can do that. Here's what you're really doing, $40,000 loan, 48 months, remember that payment was the 0% loan rate? you effectively, the car company's charging you almost a 6% interest rate for that car if you pay $45,000 for it. So well, all we're really saying here is you should always really look at the numbers. You can call us, we can give you help to analyze them to make, make sense of it. You can get many cases, you can get lower financing from a credit union. Maybe your bank would give you lower financing. So theoretically, if you could go out and get a $40,000 loan from someplace, we very seldom or we very often say, hey, your cash values are a really good spot to use as we've developed in your, your cap plan. But if you can get $40,000 $40, from any of the other spots, you've saved $5,000 on, on the vehicle. And even if the credit union charges you 2.9, 3.4, you're gonna be a whole heck of a lot better off. So the bottom line is, Insurance, car companies make more money from their financing arms than they do in selling cars. So typically zero is not zero, 0.9 is not 0.9, and we can help you run through those to, if you don't quite understand what we're talking about tonight. So give us a call. Remember, <clears throat> you have, because you're online, because we're, we work together on all of these things, you've got a free 30-minute free consultation that's available to you. Take advantage of Steve's and my expertise in showing you things that are myths that a lot of people will never know the difference on. They just think, great, at zero. Boy, it's that, that's a price. I can pay it on a monthly basis. I'm in. Well, it's not quite as good as it appears. Now, the next one is, if you have a life insurance policy, and this could go for car insurance and some of the other uh, insurances too, um, and you can pay a number of different ways. What we're looking at here is if you could afford to pay annually versus paying monthly. This is just if your life insurance premium was $12,000 and if it was a 0% rate of return, it's pretty simple math, your payment would be $1,000 a month. That's very simple. Everybody understands what that is. But the insurance companies basically charge a monthly factor. And this is just one of them. There are, there are a lot of them out there, but they're all pretty close. So what that's saying is, if you had a $12,000 annual premium and you wanted to pay it monthly, it's not $1,000 a month, it's $1,026 a month. So what that shows, and we'll show on the next screen, it's about a 5% interest charge to pay on a monthly basis instead of an annual basis. The life insurance company in this case is loaning you their money to pay the annual premiums. Thinking in terms of they have assets, those assets are working for them, if they basically transfer their money into paying that annual premium for you, creating all the cash value, et cetera, and you're paying a monthly, they have to earn money on that $12,000. So they are charging you a factor on that. Now, if you aren't earning 5%, if you have other assets out there, whether it be savings accounts, you have savings accounts out there and they're earning one, maybe 2%, you know, here in July of, uh, 2019, then you ought to look at transferring that money to pay. 
for the annual premium and save yourself a 5% uh, fee on it. So they are making money on it. Now, many cases when you're first getting started, you don't have the extra money to pay an annual premium. What we try to help all of our clients get to is where they can pay an annual premium because what it does is it drives almost all the cash value that's gonna be in the policy right up there up front. So if we're using it to leverage, if we're using it to pay off uh, equipment and the practices, all of a sudden that money's available to use right away. So it's a much, much more efficient way of doing it. Here's the factor there, 12,000 at basically the same $1,026, $1,027 we showed um, from the charge, that's basically a 5% interest charge that the life insurance company is charging you. So we always try to document it so you can look back at it and go, oh, well, yeah, that is 5%. I, I didn't realize that. Okay, this is really an interesting part. You know, how banks make money basically is uh, not very well, it's pretty much a hidden secret. And the reason being is that the banks don't want we, the public, to know. They don't want us to understand how it works. As you've heard us say before, or looked at blogs, or the live webinars, or just things that we've got out on the Rich Dentist, Poor Dentist website, that are very, very powerful education stuff. Banking business is the most profitable business in the world. Well, if it's the most profitable business in the world, are they or any of their representatives going to teach you how not to use them? And the answer is, of course not. And we don't blame them. It's a capitalistic society, and they've got a, a way that is very, very profitable for them, and they don't want anybody else to know. But that's why, after this, you'll understand why we want you to become the bank. Whether it's, again, loaning to your practice, paying off student loans, leveraging it into other wealth options, you know, real estate or other things that you can use the money for, it's important that you can become the bank. Now, said earlier on that first screen, in the 1980s, interest rates were really high. Many of you probably weren't even alive then. Uh, Steve is a little bit younger than I, but he probably still remembers some of those interest rates, you know, also. Yep. So back then, if you put money in the bank, they could pay you 9% on that CD. Well, what do you get today? One, maybe two. So significantly different times, but it would cost you maybe up to 15% for a car loan or a mortgage loan. Now, a question that most people don't think of, whose money does the bank use when they loan it out? They loan out our money. They don't wanna loan out their money because they make a much, much better rate of return using our money. So look at, look at it this way, if their cost that means they're paying us on the CD 9% and they loan it out at 15%, they were making a 6% spread. Now, most people think a profit that they made a 6% you know, profit. Well, not exactly. One of the things that's important to understand when we're looking at how banks make money, and we'll talk about it in the next slide or two, is you need to get the word rate of return and interest rates out. And we need to put it in the, uh, the term of, in the dentist world, if a piece of equipment costs you X dollars and you sold it for Y dollars, we can more readily determine what that rate of return, the gross profit would have been or would be. So we'll go look at that here in a minute. So here's the cost. They pay us, pay us in the $1980, they're paying us 9% on the CD they loaned the money out at 15. Look at that rate of return. It isn't a 6% rate of return. It's a 67% rate of return. Look at it this way. If their cost is 9%, my writing tonight's not very good, sorry. And they make 15%, that's a 6% or a $6, sorry, I didn't do it properly myself. So it's not 15%, they make a $15 profit. So they've got a profit. Well, my screen just is jumping all over the place, sorry. Well, let me see if I can get that screen back. 
Okay. Right. Well, Sorry about that. So $6 profit on a cost of $9 basically is $6 profit on a $9 cost is a 67% profit. Once you take the interest assumptions, the interest rates out, it's much, much easier to understand how that worked. Now, in the 90s and er into the early 2000s, many of you remember, there were banks that were in all kinds of trouble. There were bailout programs the federal government uh, put in place for them. Alan Greenspan was the head of the Federal Reserve Board at that time. And he thought that if you lowered interest rates, it would help everybody. So then the banks couldn't pay 9% on a CD. They could only pay 3%. They couldn't loan money out at 15. They could only loan it out at nine. So if you talk to 100 people and said, if they paid three, loan it out at nine, it's the same 6% spread. I wonder how many of you out there tonight think a 6% spread is a 6% spread. It should be the exact same rate of return. That's a very logical way to think about it when you just look at spreads. But let's look and see what happens. Look at the number there. It's a 200% rate of return. A cost of three to the bank. They loan it out at nine. They have a $6 profit on a $3 cost a 200% rate of return. Now, I don't know about you all, but Steve and I have talked about it. I would love if I could run 67% profit, you know, in my business. All the dentists we talk to across the country are going, man, if I could make 67% every year, I'd be happy. Well, the poor banks were in trouble. That's why the bailouts happened. They couldn't make it on 67%. So by making that small change and having interest rates come down, they were able to move it up to a 200% profit. What a great business. <laughs> what we want to do is help you do what the banks can do. Can't tell you that we're going to make you a 200% profit, but using your bank as you develop the cash values to be able to use will produce significant rates of return for you. And, and you'll create a level of control and leverage that you'll be very, very comfortable with because without it, the banks always have the control and the leverage over what we do. And none of the decisions that were made that Rich is talking about, um, at, none of those decisions you know, were made by asking us, the general public, should they do that? <laughs> so they actually just made those decisions and most people just had to react to them. So. Um, I, I see that, you know, that, you know, no, I'm not, uh, I had, wasn't around for a lot of these things in the 70s and the 60s, but I know that through history, uh, a lot of these decisions by the Federal Reserve have been repeats, uh, like what we're going through now. Yep, that's right, Steve. Um, and it's interesting, a buddy of mine, well, a buddy of mine used to be a buddy of mine, he's passed away now. He had a conversation, he lived down in Texas. And he had a conversation with a banker down there. And he explained, this was in the 90s, and he explained this process to him about the profits. And the banker looked at him and he goes, will you please do me a favor? And he said, what do you want me to do? Would you please not tell anybody that I didn't understand that? So it's not just the general public that understand it. Most financial people don't understand it. Again, a lot of this information is at our dentaldebtrelief.com, you know, website out there. So it's important that you can take this information, become a little bit more uh, comfortable with why what we're doing on an uncommon basis is so important to your wealth and your control of cash and capital, as Steve said. Okay, now we're going to talk about the Laffer curve. What's one thing we all dislike? high income taxes. Now, a lot of people don't know this. If they've been through the process with it, they do know it. We did not have a personal income tax in the United States until 1913. So 1776, 
1913, no personal income tax. They had spice taxes, they had excise taxes, they had real estate taxes, they had some taxes, but there were no personal income taxes. There was an interesting thing that happened before this personal income tax was passed, an awful lot of the very, very wealthy people, the Cardangies, the Fords, uh, Milton Hershey of the Hershey Candy, they all set up trusts. And those trusts were granted favorable tax in treatment as long as the trust stayed in existence. So the exercise here is we're looking at 106 years. We're looking at from 1913, basically up to 2019. And the numbers aren't important. The concept is really important. So what we're looking at here is a $20 deposit if it earned a 20% rate of return over the next 106 years. Down here, you can see tax revenue that can go up for the government. The tax rates can go up or down. So this just gives you kind of what the Laffer curve looks like. So let's take a look and see. The calculation shows basically $4.9 billion over that 106 years. You can see it down here. So what that's saying is, if you'd have put just 20 bucks away, in 1913, and it grew at 20%, your 20 bucks have been almost $5 billion. That's a pretty impressive number. We all know that that probably didn't happen. So let's just see what we can come up with. So we're gonna look at, and again, for you that have been around and have seen our history of US taxes, um, we're gonna use a 50% tax bracket here. The average highest marginal bracket since 1913 up through 2018 is about 58%. So for the people who have made a lot of money for a long time, and hopefully you dentists are going to make a, money, a lot of money going into the future for a long period of time. But if it was only a 50% tax bracket, that drops from $4.9 billion to $488,000. See what happened here? The old money tree is getting chopped down and it's all because of the taxes over there. So how can that happen? Well, let's look. There's 20 bucks, 106 years, 50% rate. You see tax, the government made 488,000 bucks and you were left with 488,000 bucks. Thing that pe most people miss, compound interest is an eighth wonder of the world. In our first scenario there, it was compounding at 20%, $20 every year, interest on top of interest on top of interest. As soon as the taxes start hitting it, you don't have the compounding interest effect because you're peeling money off to pay taxes. So it has a dramatic effect on what the ultimate value of the account would be down the line. So what does that really mean? Did the government get the other 4.1 billion or more? Most people think, well, if we didn't get it, they had to get it. No, it vanished. No one got it. And they didn't get it because it wasn't in the account. It didn't have a chance to grow in the account because the tax effect. There's an optimum tax. You know, if we had everybody live on here tonight, I would be asking for hands of who, what you think the optimal tax is. Well, we could play the game. I'm just going to show you what the optimal tax would be. It's basically about a six and a half percent tax. So we would have had 1.5 billion and the government would have made 108 million dollars. So us having 1.5 billion in the uh, U.S. government taxing, getting 108 million, that's a pretty significant difference between $488,000 if they taxed it at 50%. So varying scenarios, but point being here is, and here's the numbers there, there's the 5.1.5 billion, and there's the 108 million that the income taxes they would have received. So as the down at the bottom here, the point is, that lower taxes don't get as much money right away, but significantly more over time. If you ask anybody that's in the political field, do they expect our government to be around a long time? Most everybody would say yes. I mean, there's some people out there today that might not think that, but 
for the most part, they're going to think the government's been around, going to be around a long time. Well, if you think about it, would they rather have $108 billion or million dollars or $488,000? There's no question about it. So understanding how money works can help the government and us manage our money a heck of a lot better to create the maximum amount of profits that we can have. Okay, here's a real big one that a lot of people never think about. Average rates of return versus actual rates of return. Almost all financial products are promoted by average rates of return. For those of you out there that have been in 401k plans, simple plans, uh, have individual mutual funds, typically when you're talking about retirement plans, almost right, all retirement plans use mutual funds. And you could have a personal advisor, but many times the bigger the plan you're in, there's no one to talk to. But even if you do have someone to talk to, even the, the folks that work for us in our retirement plan division, they will go in and they will show all the employees what the average rate of return to help them to decide where to put their money, which makes sense because most people don't have a clue of, of where, you know, there's 35 different mutual funds I can use here. I don't have any idea. So they'll choose based on average rates of return. The problem or a problem is <clears throat> it, there is or it can be a big difference between the average and the actual rates of return. Let's look at two comparisons. The first one's a very simple one. <clears throat> and some of you have seen this. If you start with 100,000 bucks, you lose 20,000 bucks in a year, you've got $80,000 left. Makes sense, pretty easy math. Most people think if you had your 80,000 and you make 20%, you're going to be back to even. But a 20% rate of return on 80 only gets you $16,000. So what's happened over that basically two year period? The average rate to return says 20 down, 20 up. I've got a 0% average rate of return. Well, if you started with 100,000 and you had a 0% rate of return, I think most people would say I'd have $100,000 left. Well, obviously that's not what happened. So the actual rate of return, 20 up, 20 down, produces a 4% loss. That's your 96,000 after you started with 100 with an average rate of return of zero, but turns out to be a 4% loss. That's why we talk about that a lot of times money is not math and Math is not money and money is not math. You have to look at things more on a macro basis instead of just going, oh, well, yeah, 20 up, 20 down. You know, I'm even, you know, with that. Here's the other piece. This just shows, pulled out from one of our providers. Here's the Dow Jones. So everybody knows the Dow Jones is roughly at 27,000. So this just shows a pretty darn good period from 1999 to the end of uh, 2018. So the average rate of return down here, you can see, is 5.96, where the actual rate of return over that same period is 4.77. Let's just call that 1%. A lot of people go, well, big deal, Rich, big deal, Steve, you know, what's 1%? If you took $10,000 over 30 years, at 1% rate of return, people think you're gonna have much money there? You would have an extra $350,000. A 1% rate of return can be huge. So in most cases, when you look at it and you're looking at an average rate of return and you're projecting that at the 5.96 or whatever number you're projecting it at, you're gonna highly overinflate the amount of money you're gonna have down there because the average return versus the actual, the actual is almost always lower. The only time the average rate of return is correct is if in your time frame you never had a negative year. Now this isn't the whole time frame, but if you look over here, 99 through 2012, how many negative years were there? Not a lot, but there were enough in there to drop that rate of return by you know almost one and a quarter percent. So but one percent over that period of time, you're talking about a boat boat load of money. What Steve and I try to do when you're looking at various spots to put your money 
is help you understand and see the differences between average and actual. Most financial advisors, they don't have a clue because they never looked at it. They rely on the mutual fund companies that the average rate of return is the correct rate of return. It might be numerically correct, but it's not real money correct. And see if we help you look at actual rate of return, then we can literally help you make money and put you in a position to win. And that's really what our, what our program is about. You know, yep. put you in a position to win. That's right. As the top says, most people will do almost anything to not pay interest on their purchases. They believe that if you don't pay anyone interest, you will help yourself make more wealth. Everybody thinks that when you pay cash, and this is a correct statement, you get rid of interest. So if you don't have to borrow the money from the car company and you can pay cash for the car, then you have not paid any interest. That's a good thing. But the question you should be asking is did you get rid of the interest cost? Not did you get rid of paying interest, but did you get rid of the interest cost? What does that even mean? Well, when you pay cash, that means you've taken your money out of something. You could have had it in stocks. It might have been in a money market account. It might have been in mutual funds. But whatever you took it out of, you were earning some money on it. So when you take it out of there, you have not, you're not gonna make any money on it any longer because it's not in the account anymore. So the money you've saved or invested to make the purchase has lost the ability to continue to earn interest. So even though you've not paid interest on the purchase, you have lost interest on the money that you used for the purchase. For those of you who've been around with us before, that loss of interest is known as the lost opportunity cost. And it needs to be measured in every transaction for you to understand whether or not you got a good deal or not. The reason that a lot of times people don't understand this is because they stop right at the beginning. Would you be better off paying interest to banks and car companies or better off not having to pay it and paying cash? Well, if you stop right there, that's a no brainer. You would always pay cash, but it depends on the rest of the story, so to speak. So if we look at just an example, excuse me, using the 45,000 we used earlier, if you paid cash and you bought a car every five years, the interest lost could be any amount. I just happened to use 5% for the lost opportunity or the LOC cost. If you, let's say you took money out of the mutual funds, or let's say you took money out of the stock market over the last, that have been there five, six, seven years you might have a lost opportunity cost of 10, 11, 12%. We just used five here. So here are, took about 45,000 to buy the car, 45,000 to do it again, 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 again. So totally those times, that means you took money from somewhere that you had $225,000. So let's look at the interest, the money that could have made over that period of time, 700, and $15,000. Now that's significant amount of money over the next 30 years. Many of you out there are in your 30s. That means you're gonna buy cars up until you're at least in your mid 60s or further. If you did this, you could just count on, I'm gonna have 715,000 bucks less because I've used that money. Real thoughtful question here, how many families only have one car? Most are gonna at least have two, not counting kids. Well, if you have two, you're talking about almost a loss potential of $1,500,000. I'll tell you what, if we've got any dentists that are older tonight and they're looking at retirement, they would be elated if we could add another million five back into their accounts, which with our philosophies and our banking and creating you to become the bank and using your cash values, it's exactly what we're able to do. So you wouldn't need to sell investments or liquidate cash for these major purchases. Huge, huge deal to make sure you understand why you don't wanna pay cash. So really what we've done tonight is we've looked at six, basically common misconception about how money really works. And that 
hopefully we've uncovered tonight how important that can be to your wealth creation. If you've been with us before, you see our house of money. What we want to do is keep the money from flying away. Most time people don't lose money because they've just done bad things. They lose money because they don't have any understanding of why it's working the way it's working. So what we try to do is guide and educate our clients to these types of financial questions so you, they can look over that you've been looked over or you don't even think about. That's why taking advantage of our 30-minute free consultation is so gosh darn important to you. You're busy, you're running practices, you want to be more efficient in your practice, you're not getting the advice from the traditional or the common advisors out there because they're not being taught this economics here. Uh, so money, we want it to grow. We don't want the banks to have it. We want you to have it. So in essence, thanks for tonight. We really appreciate it. But we need to get together because it's your future that's important. We can't help you if you don't reach out to us. We don't have phone numbers for a lot of you. We don't have... We got an email for most people, but no phone numbers. So there's our contact information. You know, please, please, for your own benefit, take advantage of our offer for a 30-minute free call. I mean, Steve and I are getting more busy and more busy with dentists and other individuals that are starting to learn and understand this, especially after they go to the website, the Rich Dentist Poor Dentist website, the Dental Vet website, and so they can learn more about it, and they're reaching out to have us at least help decide whether these types of uh, planning techniques can benefit them. And for the most part, they can benefit everyone we talk to. Well, Steve, that's what I've got tonight. I know there were a few questions. I want you to read them to me. I'll see if I can answer them. Yeah, we've got um, one or two. Um, uh, first one is um, why don't the banks want us to understand how money really works? What yeah. I think we kind of answered that, but you can yeah. Try to get well, yeah, real quick, I guess, on that is their capitalism, the banks, and we all get that. That's what our dental practices are or our business. They need to make profits. They're not going to give away their secrets and take profits away from themselves. So your banker is there to help you, but your banker is there to help you in the process of helping the bank make money also. So they're not going to teach you any of the strategies. And uh, why don't other advisors help to understand are these different ways to look at money, I guess, and why, why do we operate differently? Yeah. That's another really good question. Keep in mind how most financial advisors are trained. Just the example of the banker. The bank trains all their advisors. We already know they're not going to learn and be taught that to help us do better on those. In the insurance industry, in the mutual fund industry, do you think anybody in the mutual fund industry is going to get taught how to explain how actual rate of returns are versus average rates of return or the tax impact? No. So the training comes from the organization that's going to make the most profit. Steve and I have been trained from an economic modeling. So we've been trained to look at these things that we've discussed tonight to make sure everything is, you know, upfront, clear, definable, looking at calculators to, to help you see that. We've got time for maybe one more, Steve. Uh, let's see. Uh, how do car companies get away with saying zero interest? <laughs> yeah, that's really kind of a funny interest. one, too. Um, the reason they get away with it is because when they say it's a $45,000 car and they divide that by 12 or they divide it by 48 months, it comes out to $937.50. So that's a 0% interest. What they don't say or what they couldn't get away with is it's a $40,000 car it's 0% interest and you're going to pay us $937. That would just be totally false, but that's an actual fact. What happens in most cases when you have the rebates there? So they're not doing anything wrong. They just inflated the price of the car to make it appear that it's a 0% rate of return. Well, Steve, I think uh, that probably is all the time we have tonight. Any final thoughts you might have? Well, no, uh, just uh, I hope that everybody understands that, you know, our process, as we said in the beginning is, uncommon to most people but it is becoming to get more common as we go forward because some of the tools that we use create levels of certainty and guarantees so that you can keep your money and it grows for you 
especially the hard-earned money that you make uh, in your practices uh, and every day that you go out to make money. So we're really excited and, and interested in showing you just how this works. And obviously, like we said, it's no obligation, so you get to learn something. So looking forward to speaking with everybody. And thanks, Rich, for uh, we'll probably see you in September. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, very, very eloquently said. Thanks again for everybody's attention tonight. We look forward to talking to you. Enjoy the rest of the summer.